Uh, I'm Mitchell. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. And I would like to welcome you all to this uh, really very, very special, special event this evening. You know, when, I, when I've contemplated this evening, I realized uh, that this is why I'm kind of like the luckiest guy in the world, that I get to stand up here and introduce Tom McGuane to all of you. Um, while I was driving over, I was thinking about all the connections I had with, uh, with Tom, connections he knows nothing about, but I do. Uh, I first, I first uh, encountered him when I was just a, a college kid, uh, reading those remarkable books of his like uh, Sporting Life and Panama, 92 in the Shade, uh, all of those uh, early works which uh, knocked the socks out of, off of so many of us. In fact, when I was walking in here, um, I bumped into someone who's coming to the event tonight and he said, I, I knew you'd be here for this one. Uh, you know, he's one of my favorite, and I heard Americans, which I thought was very, very accurate and true. Even though he might have thought to himself, American writers, I heard Americans. And he is one of, of my favorite Americans as well. Um, and he is very much so uh, the favorite of so many uh, over the years who've written about him. Uh, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, piece that appeared uh, in the New York Times Book Review uh, maybe for a previous book. I just love this quote about Tom McGuane. Astonishing. McGuane has become our poet philosopher of the arm's length, a writer who knows something about writing, real writing, words as access to the soul. McGuane has driven so hard into the heart of a received wisdom concerning American manhood, otherwise known as American loneliness, that he has broken through to the other side. Um, this new book has been met with remarkable reviews. In fact, there's one I hope you won't miss in this Sunday's New York Times book review. Make sure you get a copy of it. It's kind of remarkable. But prior to that one, PW says of this new collection that we celebrate tonight, Crow Fair, uh, Publishers Weekly has said, McGuane's Montana retains wistful and ironic echoes of the Old West with imagery as sparse and striking as the landscape. These stories highlight the detachment of young from old, husband from wife, neighbor from neighbor, the dying from life itself, through, money, through many funny, sad, and awful, awfully human moments. It's a rare honor and a rare treat to have Tom McGuane with us tonight. He, as many of you know, he doesn't travel, uh, he doesn't tour widely, and it's, uh, we're really, really fortunate uh, that we're able to present him tonight to you all here in Carl Gables. As you know, tonight we're also having it on live stream, so please uh, make sure you have some questions ready. And if you're sitting next to someone you shouldn't be because it's being filmed, <laughs> you, might wanna, you might wanna move around a little bit. But again, please join me in giving a very, very warm welcome to Tom McGuinn. Is this the uh, for the water? Is that thing you're talking about? Hey, Mitch, give me a book. I just want. Let me. Have that. Hi, everybody. I'm I'm flattered. Uh, you know, for somebody who repeated the ninth grade and flunked out of college, it's a thrill to see all of you. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a story that's not very long, uh, and, I, and my motive is to get on to kind of a conversation with you all, and I hope we can talk about anything you feel like. I have a neighbor on the other coast of Florida from England who introduced himself by saying, I like to talk to people who like to talk. And I feel the same way. So if there's anything on your minds, there's nothing out of bounds. And, um, and even, uh, you're even allowed to laugh. <laughs> so this is, uh, let me find this story that I want to read. This is a story called Casserole that I published in The New Yorker a couple of years ago. Anyway, before I pulled this book together. And uh, you'd think at this point I'd remember where it was, but uh, I'm only the author. <laughs> it's like the... The husband's always the last to know. It's like kind of, so. so this is called Casserole, set in my home state of Montana, where it shocks me since I moved there 
after school shocks me to think that I've been for, there for almost a half century and have um, lost the right to have a midlife crisis. <laughs> so, we waited under the cottonwoods for the ferry to come back across the Missouri River, but the heat still throbbed from the metal of our car and it turned out to be better to stand close to the water. The river seemed so big, its incongruous whisper belying its steady speed. Clouds of swallows chased insects over the water, and doves rested in the shadows. My wife kept touching her forehead with a Kleenex and staring across at the ferry as if to hurry its return. We could see the ferryman chatting with his passengers, which only increased her agitation. We're heading from our home in Livingston, Montana, to L.A.'s family ranch to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. 25 years and no children. Her parents had stopped interrogating us about that. They assumed that it was a physical problem that some clinic could solve. But we just didn't want children. We lacked the courage to tell her parents that. We both liked children. We just didn't want any. There were children everywhere, and we saw no reason to start our own brand. Young couples plunge into parenthood, and about half the time they end up with some ghastly problem on their hands. <laughs> we thought we'd leave that to others, but my in-laws were elderly, and they had the usual views of hereditary landowners. They longed for an heir. They had acquired their land from my wife's grandfather, and with it, a belief in family values that did not stand up to scrutiny, since most ranches these days were the scenes of bitter inheritance battles. But even if my wife had had siblings, she would not have been part of this sort of trouble, as she had never, at least not since adolescence, wanted to pursue ranch life, rural life, agricultural life. She would have said to a sibling, take it, it's yours, I'm out of here. There would have been an element of posturing in this because she was very attached to the land. She just didn't want to own it or to do anything with it, and neither did I. The thing, is, thing was that we were quite poor. We were both grade school teachers, and owning a house had been the extent of our indulgences. We loved our house and our work, and were suitably grateful for both, though Ellie felt that if I hadn't been so hell-bent on retiring the mortgage, we might have done a few more things for fun. My in-laws couldn't believe that we had no interest in owning a ranch that was worth millions, but they wouldn't have allowed us to sell it. We'd be stuck with it if we went along with them, which we weren't about to do, and so now they were stuck with it cows, farming equipment, fences, the whole enchilada, and they were getting old. The ranch was going to eat them alive, and they knew it. The fences would fall, the cows would get out, the neighbors, old friends, would start to think of them as a problem. Once across this river, we'd be heading for a very sad story. Well, not that sad. They'd had their day, and it was almost over, and that's how it is for everyone. They liked to be seen as heroic strivers alone on the unforgiving prairie, but they could have handed the ranch over, no strings attached, and headed for Arizona. After the sale, there would have been plenty for everybody. I had an extensive collection of West Coast jazz records, including the usual suspects, Jerry Mulligan, Chet Baker, Stan Getz, and so on. Not everybody has Wardell Gray or Buddy Collette, but I did. And if we'd had a bit more dough, I could have added a room to our house specifically to house this collection with an appropriate sound system. But when I complained about things like this to Ellie, she just said, cue the violins. <laughs> it looked as though our appallingly high mileage compact car was going to be the only one going on the ferry. My wife and I sat on the front while the back seat was filled with her belongings, as was the trunk. I had no idea why she felt called upon to bring this exalted volume of luggage unless it was to store things on the ranch that were cluttering up our little house. I could have asked, but I didn't feel like it. I think he's turning around, Ellie said, and I came out of, came out of my trance. The cable grown next to us, and across the river, I could see the ferry finally moving our way. Ellie was looking forward to this visit, and I certainly was not. The ranch was where she had grown up as a nature lover, and despite all its deficiencies, it was her place on earth. We watched the ferry, ferry tack across the Missouri, tugging at an angle to the cable, then landing with a broad thump on the ramp. 
The ferryman, who was far too young for the wide red suspenders he affected, motioned us forward, and I drove our piece of shit car onto the deck. <laughs> While we crossed, my wife stood on the ferry deck, looking out at the river, smiling and sighing at the swallows, circling the current. I told her they were just after the bugs. She said she understood that, but they looked beautiful, whatever they were doing. Was that all right with me? I've long had trouble with pe people picking out some detail of the landscape and pretending it's the whole story, as though, in this case, the blue light around those speeding birds could do anything to mask the desolation of the country north of the river, a land I traverse holding my nose. Aren't you supposed to get out, going to get out of the car, she asked. Who's supposed to drive it off the ferry, I said. I looked away from my wife, turned on the radio, no signal. I thought about her peculiar cheer today. I supposed it was the prospect of seeing her mother and father, of revisiting the scenes of her childhood, which she had done often enough to prove the utter heroism of my patience. Though, though in recent times we had talked less and less, which begged the question, what was there to talk about? We worked and we saved. We saved quite a bit more than Ellie would have had she been in charge of things. What was becoming a comfortable nest egg would have disappeared in jaunts to Belize or some other place where Ellie could show more of the body she was so proud of to anyone and everyone. She once had the nerve to point out that all the saving up for old age was remarkable for someone who had so much contempt for the elderly. I said, <laughs> I said, ha, ha, ha. She was going to have to settle to wig for wiggling her, her butt in the school corridor until the inevitable day when the damn thing sagged. At last we landed, and I drove off. Ellie was having a lively chat with the ferryman, and she took her time getting back to the car. I stared straight through the windshield until she got around to it. When she climbed in with a sort of bounce, she exclaimed, He grew up on the neighbor's place, the Showalters. He's a Showalter. Graduated from Winnet, where I went. Ah, I said. The wrench was no more than a half an hour from the ferry. Ellie's excitement grew along the route. A sampler of, her ex sampler of her exclamations includes, Look at the antelope, there must be a hundred. Oh, I smell the sage now. This road looks like a silver ribbon. Those are red-tailed hawks riding that thermal. Larkspur, what a great year. Can you imagine what Dad's, Dad's calves will look like? To this last, I said, no. <laughs> I honestly thought she was getting manic as we approached the ranch. Ellie is an enthusiast, but this went well beyond her usual behavior. I don't know if she detected my concern, but she seemed to catch herself and clam up. She was talking less, but I could still feel her glee from my position at the wheel. I wondered if this situation might call for a pill. <laughs> I drove under the ranch gate with its iron brand hanging overhead, two inverted V's known in the graceful local vernacular as the Squaw Tits brand. Dad, as I had long felt obliged to call him, and his wife, Mom, stood at the edge of the yard, framed from behind the, by their bitter little clabbered house. Dad was in full regalia, Stetson hat, leather vest, cowboy boots, and this thing was new, a six-gun. Mom was dressed more conventionally, except for the lace-up boots with her wash dress and the lunch pail she was holding. Believe me, it was Methuselah and his bride at the Grand Old Opera. <laughs> There was something about their expression I didn't like. It was my turn to keep busy as I tried to elicit signs of life from this tableau, which now included my somber wife. Dad helped me unload Ellie's considerable baggage, and once it was on the ground, Mom handed me the lunch pail. What is this, I asked. Something to eat on your way home, she said. A casserole. I, t I turned to Ellie. Tears had filled her eyes. I felt that this could have been handled in some other way, <laughs> without Dad's hand on the gun and so forth. I think at times like this, your first concern is to hang on to a shred of dignity. If I'd had a leg to stand on, it was that Ellie was upset, and I was not. What kind of an idiot, anyway, puts a casserole in a lunch pail? <laughs> After I got back on the ferry, the thought that I was headed, well, I was headed home. And I was not entirely comfortable with this thought. And I didn't enjoy the ferryman staring at me either or asking if someone had shot my dog. I just stared at the river, hardly a ripple in it, 
and many miles to go before the next bend. Thank you. Now this is my favorite part, where we get to talk. So I have to have some reciprocity from you all. Here come the lights. You may start dashing me with questions. All right, folks, whoever might have a question or comment for Mr. McGuane, raise your hand. Let me get to you with the microphone. Why'd you choose that? Okay. Why did I choose what? That, that particular story. Well, I had, I mean, it was a mechanical problem. Most of the stories in here are about 40 minutes long. I think, <laughs> I, and, and uh, that's the only kind of short story in the story so the collection. Yeah. And um, whenever I go to readings, I, I, after about 15 minutes, I either lose track or I've started fantasizing off on something I heard in the story, and then I tune back in and I've lost track of the narrative. And so I, I myself like to go to readings that I can. Uh, I can pay attention to. My, my attention span is not terribly long. <laughs> so. Yes? Um, how long ago did you leave the Keys and do you miss Key West? Oh, I left a long time ago. My, um, I left in 1978. Um, and I went back quite a lot. My mother lived there until 1981. And when she passed away, I stopped going altogether. Then we have so many dogs, we, we've ended up over on the west coast of Florida when we can get out of Montana. Um, in Wait, a place that's on the west coast? Uh, Boca Grande. Okay. And uh, it's a dog-friendly place. And they look, there are very few places in Florida where you can let your dog go on the beach. And you can in Boca Grande. Usually you have to, you have to uh, dodge the authorities a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but I had a, we have a friend, actually I stole a line from her. She was running her dog in the forest, or the, whoever the federal patrol, the equivalent of the Forest Service, uh, confronted her and was ranting about her being on the, on the beach with her dog. And she finally said to him when he was done, she said, let me ask you something. What is this really about? Is it because you're short? <laughs> <laughs> so. Who else? Yes, sir. Right. Is that anything to do with your decision to go there, or, and do you still fish? Or? I fish all the time, but uh, you know, my dad used to take me there to fish. But long ago, when I, was, I have a picture of myself fighting a tarp, and my dad's holding the chair. The Boca Grande Lighthouse is in the background. And the year was 1951, <laughs> so, and uh, it's changed tremendously since then. It used to be a sand road going down the middle of the island, no bridge, and so on. It's getting Getting to be a little, little um, kind of a mini Palm Beach in some ways. But did you ever drink in the St. Elephant? Oh yeah, yeah. And when I was ten or eleven, I was my father would abandon me in the Pink Elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Is it still there? Oh yeah, they moved it. They moved it a little bit. It was getting kind of run down. It was a kind of getting to be a place, a good place to buy drugs, and so somebody Where bought it. it and, huh? Where is it? <laughs> Not that far. You get time. You've got time. So, we're not having any luck on this side of the room. <laughs> what if that's a yes, sir? Do you still do you ever go back and read your old uh, your old stuff? And, 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 and no, not much. <laughs> I'm an obsessive reviser. You know, I heard a quote just the other day. Ernest Hemingway said, "Nobody's ever read anything I've written." Said Hemingway. He said, "They've only read what I've rewritten," <laughs> and uh, that really rings the bell with me. I, I, in fact, I do first drafts is a necessity, so I have something to revise. And uh, so when I go back to, and I've tried it, when I go back to things that are already in print, you know, I wish I could rewrite them. So I know to spare myself the pain. The things that we treasure, you wish, uh, you were kind of appalling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so much is appalling these days. <laughs> right. um, yes, sir. Well, with that in mind, how would you change the ending to 92 in the shade or uh, the movie or the book the book or, or the, the sporting club might be a little more interesting to hear about how you change the end of that one uh, uh, excuse me I just bought the book which <laughs> one <laughs> <laughs> I leave it exactly the way it is <laughs> and, <laughs> the movie thing was kind of uh, that was a different thing. You know, I had, didn't have a lot of control of the cut of that movie. I had never directed a movie before. I had, and when we got to, um, we, we edited it in, in uh, 
Pine, Pinewood Studios in London. And we were there forever. And I mean, every time I'd go home for the weekend, the producers would sneak in and try to recut it. And we, we, we cut that every which way. And we tested it in different versions and things like that. Um, I can, in fact, they're both, there are two versions that are circulating. I just, they're got, it's gotten to have a kind of a cult following, and I was going to uh, see it in New York and or talk, give a little talk with it, and they said they got the, an English version of it, a print of it. I just heard this, and I said, well, find out which ending is on that one. And you just don't know what, where it is. And that, that in, a, in, a, in a sentence, is what I didn't like about working in the movies and didn't want to do it again. Um, almost nobody has a final cut unless they've, unless they've had a huge hit before. And so I, I couldn't tolerate that, and I don't have to tolerate it writing books. Mm -hmm. so, so I dodged that question. <laughs> <laughs> you got anything else I can dodge? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir? Is how long do you carry a story in your mind? Days, weeks, a year? Uh, well, sometimes drafts of the things I'm working on will stay around for a long time. Usually I don't have such a great idea for a story to start with. I have a kind of an inkling of what, you know, what might become a story, and then just by, um, by improvising, and, and I think most writers admit that it's pretty improvisatory, at least in the beginning. Uh, and I'm a pretty reckless first drafter, but I, I'm a pretty strenuous reviser. So... I'll just go anywhere I think the story is going for a long time, knowing that I have the right, I have final cut. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I can go in and, and, uh, and uh, also the risk you take and letting yourself know you can try things and that you'll work on them later. You know, you, you don't just take the safe choices that way because uh, you, can, you, can, you can take risks. Um, but I, I never know what they're going to be about. And sometimes I think I do it. It never turns out to be true. Yeah. Yes, sir. How do you see the difference between writing a short story and writing a novel? Well, I've been half seriously telling people that I had to write 15 novels before I knew enough about writing to write short stories. <laughs> um, but uh, there are a lot of things that they're, they're you know, non-literary things that have contributed to my wanting to write short stories. One of it, which is I have a re relationship with the New Yorker magazine that I really like. and. It's, a, it's a nearly as interesting to publish a story there in terms of the feedback you get as publishing a book. And um, so, you know, you may not plan to, but it begins to affect your thinking about when you're looking at stories. The other thing about, you know, when short stories can approach some of the conditions of poetry or ly lyric poetry because of the compression. Um, and whatever plan they have, uh, whatever intention they have has to be uh, pretty clear, whereas Randall Jarrell has a wonderful uh, uh, definition of the novel, which is that it's a, uh, it's a document of a certain length with something wrong with it. <laughs> and, and I think all of you who uh, read lots and lots and lots of books, you read lot novels, and almost all of them have something grossly wrong with them. The Huckleberry Finn, maybe our nearly our greatest novel, has got a horrible mistake at the end. I mean, the end of it is a disaster. Um, uh, one of my favorite books, The Movie Goer, is, a, is just flawless right till the last 10 pages, and then it's gonna, just going to commit suicide. But it, in the novel, we understand that, and we accept it, and we see that, and we have this sort of democratic relationship with the novel. It's t stories won't let you do that. They're a little bit like plays. If you go to a play, and, you know, the play is an hour and 20 minutes long or something, has 10 dull minutes, uh, that play is not going to open the following weekend. I mean, it's, it's just deader than a doornail for, for a very minor infraction by comparison to the novel. Um, you know, great novels, you know, Tolstoy's novels, Dostoevsky's novels, they have things that are brutally wrong with them. But the form is just, you know, it's just forgiving. Stories are very unforgiving. so. Uh, but one thing I like about writing stories is that once you accept that about it, you can you can actually try, successfully or otherwise, to work toward perfection. Um, and you, you may get may not get there, but at least it's one of the goals. And I think uh, I think most novels will admit that they write and they revise, and then they just somebody just takes it away from them. They just say, you know, enough already. It's not any further work is not going to improve it. But the, with the exception of Flaubert or 
Turgenev, I don't think the idea of perfection hardly ever enters the novel. Yes, lady way back there. If one were to approach your works for the first time, where would you suggest they start? Well, uh, right now, you know, I mean, it's, I'm sort of enamored of the last two books of stories I've done. This one and then one called Gallatin Canyon, I think are pretty, uh, they're my, right now they're my favorite books. I, but, but I also think they're um, the char characteristic of the rest of my writing. What about the novels? Um, 92 in the Shade would be a good place to start, or Driving on the Rim, a book that came out about 10 years ago. Yes? Uh, could you share with us some other authors that you admire? Oh, brother. <laughs> Working today, or, or um, let me think about that. I, you know, I've been reading so many short story writers no, there's so many really fabulous short story writers around right now. I think it's a real renaissance. But uh, I'm, you know, I'm a reader of novels, especially that um, are pretty much the ones that everybody else likes. I mean, I like Roth and Updike and uh, Styron and uh, all the American classics. At my age, most writers my age were really raised on those, you know, on Faulkner and Hemingway and Steinbeck and Fitzgerald and. Uh, I always used to say that I was I for my taste on on Jews and Southern women, you know. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, Saul Bellow was a huge influence on on what I wanted to do, you know, if I could aspire to high. Um, but uh, now there there are some one there's a Donald Antrim is a short story writer that I'm really fascinated with. He's a MacArthur Fellow this year. Um, David Means. Um, these are not household names, uh, but um, Miley Malloy, um, boy, I'm going to forget lots of them, but uh, if anybody's going to the Key West Writers Conference next year, they have all the best short story writers. And to give you, give you an idea of the interest in short, story, st short stories right now, the 2016 Short Story Conference, con conference in Key West sold out in 70 hours, a year and a half before the conference. So. There's something in the air about stories. I think one of the things is that people writing short stories now are, are the people that are most passionately interested uh, on strictly a literary. Uh, they're not really thinking in terms of movie sales or, you know, uh, going on Oprah or <laughs> any of the badges of honor that keep us going along. Uh, yes, sir. Most of your books have an aphorism at the start, which is are usually so funny or clever. Is there a, a process that you have to select that? How does that... An process? aphorism? Yeah, and then for this book, is there one? I don't think for this, because this is store, all stories, but like 92 in the Shade started with one that's kind of renowned. From, uh, from sea to shining sea, nobody seems to know what's the matter with our republic. You know, that kind of, kind of stays as an anthem-like thing. But I, no, I don't start that way, but I remember... What, hanging out with other young writers, you know, when we were in our 20s, we used to always go to bookstores and open all the new novels and read the first sentence and see whether or not, you know, you wanted to go on. And uh, there is an obsession with first sentences among fiction writers. I'm, I'm not sure it's worth doing. I mean, some of the best ones don't bother with such childish stuff, but I still do. <laughs> so. Yes? Oh, let me think. Trying to get from here to there or something. Yeah. Um, well, I think that what you're trying to do in writing narrative is you're trying to be logical and surprising at the same time. And, it's, it, and that's kind of the excitement for a reader. You're reading along, you think, I think I know what's next, and you're not right about it, but you can't claim that it was illogical or didn't proceed from the foregoing. Um, so that gap... The length of that gap is where risk lies. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if I were to write your story, and I said that, you know, that you were out and about on a Thursday night, nobody in your family knew where you were for the day, and least of all did your mother suspect that you had murdered someone. <laughs> so, so you know, I mean, that's a long leap, and not, how are we going to get there? Well, hopefully, if I'd written properly at that time, people would say, "Geez, you know, that's right. He is the." He is the murderer. I didn't think of that. <laughs> okay. Were you influenced by any English literature? 
English literature? Yeah. Oh yeah, lots of it. I mean, that was part of the, you know, the training. Some of the, my favorite books, you know, are Fielding, uh, Fielding and Dickens. There's a particular Dickens book that I really love, with Pickwick Paper, Papers, which I just think is just a great book. Um, um, you know, but that's what I studied. Some of it was, uh, you know, Stern was somebody that meant a lot to me at one point. Um, and James Joyce for language, I think all of us were kind of warped by that. The ones that were, weren't warped by Faulkner. <laughs> and the, those were the ones that weren't by, warped by Hemingway. So they were by, the big warper, warpers were around those days. <laughs> so I don't think uh, now, now we don't have such aggressive stylishness, you know, in writing. It's, we know we've been under the influence of dirty realism and photorealism and all this kind of exacting kind of uh, reportage style fiction writing that to write in the kind of sweeping stuff that Joyce or Faulkner did is something that nobody seems to be wanting to try, with the exception of um, Cormac McCarthy, who's still doing that, but he lifted that from Faulkner. We want to guess. I was going to ask you, I've been following you since 68 when I graduated, and the first three novels that you wrote were you know, since being a product of the 60s and 70s, I, I identified with them dramatically. And then you wrote Panama, I think, in the sequence. <laughs> and then there was a long time you didn't write novels at all. It seemed like there was yeah. almost a decade. You, probably you I was, bro was probably broke. You probably broke. <laughs> in Key West, you didn't have a choice, right? Yeah, right. So then there was a, a while that you didn't write them. It seemed like when you started writing again, and I can't remember the dates, but in the low 80s or something like that. Right. Um, your tone was different, and I was just wondering if, if you were aware of that, or there I, was a reason for that? Or? Well, you know, one thing that happened, I've, re I've heard myself saying this before, but my mother, father, and sister died in a very close period. I knew they had, like, over a two-year period. Yeah, it was a short, what, what was it, three years, Clark? Three years. Um, and I remember that I lost a lot of my sense of humor uh, after that. Um, and um, and yet I hadn't learned to be sufficiently solemn, you know, to figure out how to keep keep it work. So I was kind of stumped for a long time. And I think that I I've kind of got my sense of humor back, but I think probably with the my sense of the gravity of life, you know, probably was expanded by the experience overall, and that probably impacted my writing. Yeah. That's just a guess, but I think that's it's probably the case. Yeah. Interesting. Yes, sir. You said you you're a, you, you like to do a lot of revisions. I think you've done about a dozen books. I, I don't know how many short stories and articles and so forth. But over 40, 45 years, however long it's been, and I think you kind of filled in the gap a little bit. There was a, there was a gap there between novels. But did you find yourself like hold up working on a novel until you finished it? Or did you go about your life and goof off and do anything you would do normally? And, while you were working on the books? Um, well, let me tell you an, an analogous thing. I have an ex-son-in-law, Walter Kern, who wrote a book that was pretty successful without this past year, and I asked him just a short time ago, I said, are you working on a novel? He said, thank God, no. And um, I know exactly what he meant, and I used to get completely uh, in, you know, entrapped by projects that I was working on. And you'd, One time I was talking to David McCullough, you know who he is, this, this historian, and he was he did the he did a book uh, about Harry Truman, and he spent like five or six years on this book. He's very fond of his father-in-law, and he was immersed in this book, not thinking of nothing else on his mind. And when he kind of finished the book, he asked his wife about her his uh, father-in-law. She said, "Oh, he died a couple of years ago." Oh, and Saul Bellow was right work, working on a, on a Herzog, and he said he just flying high, just so excited about the way things were coming to him and writing. When he looked at, when he kind of came came to the surface, his wife had left him and he wasn't even sure when she'd gone. <laughs> yeah, he ended up on the phone. Where'd she go? When was, <laughs> when was that? Is she mad? You know. <laughs> You no, I mean, I used to be kind of like that, where I, you know, you get in and you just obsess, and everything else disappeared. And you know, I mean, life is short; you don't want to do that. And so, if anything, I've kind of admitted when there's nothing happening, writing. I used to write, in the, you know, two or three hours in the morning, and then I'd stay there all day long in the hopes of another paragraph. And I did that for years. Um, but now, when I sit down writing, I don't have anything to say. I go fishing or do something else. Uh, and I wish I'd always done that. 
because it, well, isn't, you know, it's not profitable to, to uh, just, you know, act as though you had a job at the bank. You know, you've got to, you've got to um, admit that nothing's happening. And frankly, in writing, I mean, it doesn't happen all day long. I mean, you run out of ideas in a matter of hours. Or carpal, lately, carpal tunnel syndrome <laughs> kicks in. Yes, sir. So in a story like Prairie Girl, which I managed to read today and love, um, it takes place over decades. Right. Which to me, I think, well, that could have been a novel. How did you decide to instead make it a short story versus a novel? And maybe your last answer had something to do with that. But. Uh, it wasn't really a decision, but I would say the reason I wasn't tempted to write a novel out of it is I felt that that story contained probably the limit of the information I had about the situation, that I would have to start making stuff up whole cloth about the rest of that protagonist's life. Um, uh, and then I also thought, you know, I also thought, go, I'm always trying, especially during the revision process, is to say as little as possible. Um, when we used to train horses, we always had an expression, we'd say, never ask a horse to do something the horse was going to do anyway. And if you apply that to writing, don't say anything the reader could have said for himself. And that's why, for example, radio is often much more intense than television. Because there's, you're supplying a lot of the intensity. Television, you're just sitting back there, kind of a kind of ape-like <laughs> position, waiting, <laughs> waiting to be told, you know. And, and you don't, it, the experience is rarely as intense as it is in uh, the, best, the best of radio. Um, so what is unsaid is a really a key thing in writing. You have to have a pretty good judgment about that, and you, you can't always be right. But the main thing is to never say anything that the reader could have, never write anything the reader was going to know. And so when, whenever I look at material, especially during revisions, I take out everything that, that can go because it's, you know, dead weight. Yes? question about fishing. Uh, my dad was uh, a great fisherman and uh, I used to go with him a lot. Uh, but he died and I never had asked him what fishing had meant to him. I mean, I kind of felt I knew, but I would have loved to hear it from his mouth. I wondered if you can... Fill it for him? <laughs> from your own perspective. Well, I... It means I, that much to you. Yeah, it means a ton to me. I mean, I've done it since I was a little kid. Um, and it does have, and it's hard, I don't know. I mean, I've tried to figure out why it's so important, but there is some kind of, um, uh, there was a Spanish philosopher who wrote about, a book about hunting. Um, I'll think about his name in a minute. But he said hunting and fishing are the same. There's no difference between the two. It's a sort of predatory thing. And, and our teeth indicate that we are evolved predators. Um, and, you know, I mean, the... the um, uh, anthropologists say that the, f the physiognomy of a human body um, is that of a hunter. Some, some, and then it's really embedded in our in our in our ancient DNA. And when you go hunting, you go fishing. I mean, you you have this kind of thing that kicks in, this kind of extra dimension, and it, you ignore all the clutter that's been in your life to that point. I always feel it very strongly. I mean, sometimes you arrive with the clutter, it doesn't go away for a while. But when I'm tarpon fishing or something, and I and I'm trying to figure out where fish are, what time of the day it is, which way the tide's going, which angle the sun's at, which way the wind is going, what that's going to do to places where tarpon would like to be, and all the little things that go in there, and you get in this kind of hunting mentality. Um, the English poet Hughes, who was married to uh, uh, Sylvia Plath, um, he'd quit hunting um, because uh, his wife was opposed to it. And he went out to his father's farm, they said, well, there's a, there are diseased grouse that just have to be shot. There. It's gonna, they're going to infect everything. So he said, okay, well, yeah, I'm 130 years, but I'll see if I can get them. So he went and he got the shotgun out of the house and he started walking out to the woods and he felt the landscape transform because it, 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 he had the eyes like a falcon, the eyes of a hunter. He hadn't felt that in 30 years. He said it was amazing, this kind of thing that kind of swept over him. Not everybody is afflicted with this particular retrograde passion <laughs> but I definitely feel it and I and, I, and it's kind of a con conflictive for me now I hunt I hunted probably 50 or 60 days last fall and uh, I don't like to kill anything you know I, I really don't it's just the just that 
state of mind is so great. And the other thing is, the, as we live now, I mean, we're, we're living in such psychological clutter at all times. I mean, I mean, smartphones alone are enough to ruin every, any decent life. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we all, all of us now write on laptops, you know, so you sit down. It's not your old Olympia Portable, it's a laptop. So you think, um, well, before I get started here, let me just check my email. And then, you know, and then, you know, I don't really have enough information about life in Pittsburgh, you know, so let's, let's do, you know, before I start, let's just do a Wikipedia search here. You know, and three hours go by and all you've done is scatter your brain. Well, when you're hunting or fishing, you don't do that. I mean, you just empty it and you're very focused and it's a great feeling. It's like reading books. I notice I have a Kindle and I read books most of the time, but when I, the, the level of focus that I have when I read an, or, an ordinary book completely different than reading on my Kindle because my Kindle has these little outreaches into the planet and I can click off to them. I can get my mail. Um, and, I, and since I, when I'm on a book tour or something, I have the Kindle with me because it's handy. And then when I get home and I re read a real book, I think, wow, this is peaceful concentration. I haven't had this since time of reading. So that's like hunting and fishing. Mm. Andrew Wise says, when you paint, it's what you leave out that counts. Right. It's true. And, that, and Hemingway said the same thing. I think that's very, very true. You see these painters like uh, the guy that, I can't remember his name, he sold bazillions of paintings and malls and stuff like that, these sentimental scenes of old. Thomas Kincaid. Kincaid. Thomas Kincaid. Well, there's a guy who never left out a speck. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there. <laughs> Thank you. Memory had mercifully submerged his name. <laughs> Going back to what you were just talking about, do you have any concern about future of reading given oh, yeah. the way young people now and you know, lots of young people are reading with you know, on their mobile device? I I have, but not as much as I did a couple of years ago. There seems to be a, a bounce. Um and there's something irreducible about reading. I mean, it, it may not, it, it may be the situation like classical music or something that occupies a smaller part of, you know, mass attention. But I, I don't think it's going to go away. I don't think, but it's been competing with something or other for a long time now, starting with movies, uh, and then television, and now the, everything that's digital, which is just unbelievable, where we can swamp ourselves with. Um, so, yes, I am kind of worried, but I, at the same time, I don't think we're watching a, an extirpation of print or reading. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we call you boss? <laughs> those of us that haven't been there much, uh, right. or at all, um, and who follow writers and, and the literary world in a sense, can you tell us what the allure is of Montana for some yeah, writers? Are you, is this a polite way of saying, why is it when you throw a rock anywhere in Montana, you hit a writer? <laughs> <laughs> that, you don't mind if I rephrase your question? <laughs> so, well, let's see. Montana is an unusual place in that it's not really like any of the other states around it. It's always had a very uh, complex ethnic history because of mining, railroading, uh, and then there are seven Indian tribes, and, and all, there's always been, for some reason or another, a commitment to education. There are really too many colleges in Montana. <laughs> I mean, they're all over the place, uh, ones you haven't even heard of. Um, then, um, because it's, you know, it's, we have this, something like, we have no school, money in the school system, but we have the second highest uh, literacy in the nation. University of Montana has the highest per capita production of Rhodes Scholars of any educational institution. It's not a rich college. I mean, some of them, I don't want to play into the hands of the right wing, but it is the last, uh, one of the last real bastions of the two-parent household, um, which is kind of good for schools. Um, and then the other thing is, because it's had such a diversified background, you don't really feel sti that you stick out because that's your job. It's a little bit like that. I mean, you're, you know, you're not a backhoe operator and you're not, you know, a rancher, but they've had to, they've had to get used to people doing lots of different things. 
Um, you know, Butte was the last place where you could study the English, the Irish language in the country. I, I once spoke at the Butte uh, uh, Newspaperman's Club, whatever it was called. And a hundred years ago, there were 17 different language newspapers in the city of Butte. 17 in different languages. So it's always been that kind of a place where you, it's hard to stick out because it's, it's very diverse. Now, if you go to the neighboring states, you would think that the locals had all been raised in a petri dish. They're almost, they're incredibly identical, you know. And they're worse than Montana's, all of them. <laughs> I think that's part of it. You know, and the other part of it is, I mean, it, it's like a comedian once said, you know, environmentalists don't really care about the earth. They just want a nice place to live. And, <laughs> and I think that it's a great, it's a nice place to live. It's a nice, really nice place to live. A lot of these, I was just up in Oxford, Mississippi, and I've been in Austin, Texas, and uh, Montana has this syndrome a little bit. You go to these places where a lot of cultivated people live, and uh, you drive five miles past the city limits, and you're back in the Bible Belt. <laughs> and uh, I, mean, I was just in Mississippi, in Oxford, Mississippi. You couldn't ask for a more cultivated town, but, you know, you don't have to go it's pretty easy to sort of imagine Klansmen about two miles outside of town. So that's a lot of that's true in Montana. I mean, there are places that are like Bozeman and Missoula and um, a couple of, but still doesn't have a million people in the fourth, fourth largest state in the union. You, the intimacy that we have with, um, you know, our uh, political superstructure is such that, you know, if you're annoyed by something, almost anybody would feel comfortable calling the governor or, or their representatives. It's just intimate that way. So, so I think writers like that. Speaking of Oxford, I noticed that you also um, dedicated this to Barry Hanna. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that? Barry Hanna was a, was a, died a little, not too long ago. He was a good friend of my wife's and mine. Uh, he was a very wild and crazy guy who wrote beautifully. But he also wrote uh, uh, in, a, in ways that had never been seen before. He wrote a couple of books in particular that really changed the way a lot of us looked at the English language. One was called Ray, and one was called Airships. And um, especially uh, short story writers revere him. Um, he was about half crazy <laughs> uh, most of the time. I think the last 10 or 15 years of his life, he had given up alcohol, which made a tremendous difference. But when I first knew him, he thought he was a fighter pilot. And uh, he was not a fighter pilot. <laughs> and uh, well, I, one time he called my wife and I, he was a uh, writer in residence at Missoula, and said that uh, he was ferrying a Grumman bomber to Alaska, and he's going to try to come over the house. <laughs> and would, would Laurie and I, would, I would, would Laurie and I wave to him when he went over? We bought it completely. We didn't know any better. So every plane that went over, <laughs> Doofus and Mr. Doofus <laughs> were out waving. <laughs> and he'd have, sometimes he'd have a confeder he'd have a flight suit on, with, but it would have a Confederate flag. I mean, it was just, none of it, none of it made sense. He came down one time and he said, um, "I've met the most beautiful Italian princess." And could we come and visit you? And um, so he came to visit. It was just a nice little girl from Schenectady or something. <laughs> <laughs> he came in. He had a beer in his hand. He had a flight suit, kind of a piss stain in front. It wasn't very. <laughs> and um, well, we're just going to stay in the basement. We'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> so he was colorful, but. But he was a beloved character in a way. I mean, he was just so carried away. My, I had a wonderful mother-in-law, and they were, Barry and my mother-in-law were inseparable friends. And, um, he, uh, I hate it that he's gone. He, uh, in fact, I just heard about his moment of departing this earth. R Richard Howarth, you know Richard Howarth owns uh, Square Books in Oxford, Mississippi. He got a call from Barry uh, saying um, that uh, his wife, they're both ailing, they both sick, had some kind of cancer or another, both of them. And he said, would you come and take Susan to the hospital? So Richard drove over, uh, picked up Susan, took her to the hospital, and um, when he went back to Barry to tell him what he'd done, Barry was sitting in the sofa dead. Yeah. He had smoked about two puffs on a cigarette, stubbed it out, looked perfectly peaceful, well-dressed, looking into the middle distance, and he was gone. 
I knew he did it that way on purpose because there's <laughs> something disturbing about it. <laughs> there's something disturbing about Barry. Anyway, he's a lovable guy, and I think his, uh, the best of his writing uh, is really eternal. It's going to live on. So. Yes, sir. You mentioned the editing of the, at the New Yorker. Right. Uh, How do you uh, handle the stories that, uh, it, what is it about the rigor of that that you like, and then how does that apply to the stories that are published elsewhere? Well, I, I have a contract with them, so they get first look at everything that I did, yeah. And so, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hard to predict. I mean, they, last year, uh, they turned down a story I wrote, um, and I published it in McSweeney's. Do you know McSweeney's quarterly? And it was the only story uh, that was a, the only New Yorker story of the year that was a finalist for the National Magazine Award. It was one that they had turned down and I published elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So there's always a subjective quality there. I mean, I've had stories uh, turned down by them that was just not what, what they liked. But also I have an editor there, Deborah Treisman, who's ver gotten very smart about what I do well and what I do poorly. Um, and she can really kind of track that, you know. And, you know, so if I'm writing something, she might say, is this, you know, is this really you? Or is this, did you mean this? Or, uh, and, and she's a great kind of a sixth sense for me when I'm trying to be kind of on the edge of what I can do. Um, so that happens, but there have been stories that I think were good stories that went on to get some recognition that she just didn't like. I mean, just weren't in her wheelhouse. And she kind of is the arbiter there. Um, um, She's the head of the fiction stuff. They all I, they work together in ways that I don't quite understand. I think they all have to kind of agree about things, but you work specifically with one editor or another. Does that does that answer your question at all? Okay. Let's take one more question. And the story that you read us, are there any at what point did you know the ending? Uh, when about the second I wrote it. <laughs> In fact, uh, I mean, it's hard for me to resurrect it, but I started out writing a story that was completely different than this, uh, about this woman. And I think when I got the idea that she had a, a fault-finding, annoying husband, that, that, that little gestalt just took the story in a direction of its own. I thought, it, you know, I, I mean, I don't even want to tell you what I thought I was writing in the beginning. You'd, uh, the cascade of uh, critical laughter would be more than I could. <laughs> uh, but believe me, I was a long way away from this when I started. But that's what's exciting about about um, writing is when um, when you feel something about the interior mechanics or whatever it is of the story is trying to pull you in a direction that's slightly different than what you thought you wanted to do. Not every writer feels that way. Peter Taylor said once, and he's a great short story writer, Peter Taylor said once, when I start writing and I can, the, the, the characters begin uh, speaking for themselves, he said, that's my cue to throw the whole thing out. <laughs> <laughs> most, most, most writers don't feel that way. But what are you going to say? Peter Taylor is a great writer. So. Well, this was kind of a remarkable evening. Tom McGuane, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We've got uh, Tom's new one, Crow Fair, up at the desk, as well as some of the previous books, too. And he'll be on the other side signing uh, in just a moment or two. Again, Tom O'Grain, thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming.